Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Scripture Verse by Verse Questions and Answers. I love questions, always have, from the time that I started teaching the Word of God. I love it when people ask me questions. I don't promise to have the answers, but as one man used to say, um, I can tell you what I think. And I have been studying the Word of God for 30 years, and more than that, 35 years. And the longer I study, the more I realize I don't understand, the more I don't know. But you got to pick up a few things here and there, right, in 30-some years. So send me your questions if you have Bible questions, and I will do my best to give you a biblical answer. So we're going to look at several questions today that I have received recently and um, do our best to to answer it. And, you know, one of the reasons I like these uh, questions and ask, answer sessions is because if you look at the book of Acts and even look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of it was question and answer type teaching. And so it's very biblical. And uh, not only that, if you have a question about something, there's a good chance somebody else, while reading the Bible or listening to it being taught, um, has had the same question. So who knows? The answer that I give you may help somebody else as well. So I encourage you to send in your questions as well as your comments. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on our time together. And a little different format today, but it's still your word. So, Lord, we ask that you would bless your word and sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, first question. The writer said, please explain Romans chapter 12, verse 19. So I'll turn there. Please explain Romans 12, 19, and also Deuteronomy 32, 35. So let's read Romans 12, 19 first. Let's read 18 along with it. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So that is teaching a prohibition against getting even, getting back. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 32, 35, which is, I know, the same subject. Deuteronomy 32, 35. And it says, God says, To me belongeth vengeance. And recompense. Their foot shall not slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. What God is saying is, you need to trust me. You need to trust that I am just, and because I'm just, I'm going to make sure that people don't get away with their sin. So leave, leave justice in my hands. Don't become a vigilante. Don't get revenge. Don't, somebody does something bad to you, don't say, okay, I'm going to get them back. That's what this is prohibiting. Just leave it in God's hands. He'll take care of business. Now, pray for that person's salvation so that they won't be judged even as you won't be judged for your sin if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the point is, don't get revenge. Don't get even for the sake of getting even. Now, one thing I, I must hasten to add is that this does not mean that you can't defend yourself. If somebody is doing bad things to you, well, certainly you can you can defend yourself. If somebody is treating you badly, legally, in a, in, in, through the law system, 
You certainly can get a lawyer, whether that person is a Christian or not, does not matter. You know, the prohibition of, of not taking another Christian to the, to the law courts before civil law uh, applied back in the first century when both people were going to the same church and recognized the authority of the pastor or the elders in that church to settle a matter. Now, if that's the case, fine. Let, let the pastor and the elders work it out. But if you have somebody who's living in a different area or going to a different church or isn't going at all, and, and they just call themselves a Christian and they're treating you like dirt, um, that, does, that prohibition doesn't apply to you. You can certainly take, if, if there's something illegal going on, you can defend yourself in a court of law. So that's what that's talking about. This is just a prohibition against getting revenge, getting people back, getting even. No. If somebody does something, if somebody says something to you about you behind your back, for example, leave it in God's hands. Don't go doing the same thing to them. Okay? If somebody is mean to you, don't just get them back. Don't get revenge. I'm going to get them back. I'm going to be mean to them. Leave it in God's hands. He'll take care of it. I hope, I hope you understand the difference there. Another question comes from a listener. And this is there are actually two questions from this particular person. And uh, both, both of them have to do with uh, the flood of Noah. So I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 7. And you can too if you want to. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 7 for the first question, and then Genesis chapter 9 for the second one. And the first question is this. The listener wrote, I always thought that Noah brought two of every animal into the ark. But I was reading today and saw for the very first time that in some cases there were seven animals. What is the reason for the seven? I always thought it was two. Well, let's read Genesis chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. And of the beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Verse 3. Of fowls also of the air, by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. So it is true that some, some animals were supposed to be paired up, just two, and others there were supposed to be seven. And the reason for that is because after the flood, it would be legal. God would make a decree that you no longer have to be a vegetarian, but you can now eat meat. But he didn't want them to eat the meat of unclean animals, which is why the admonition here to bring seven of all clean animals and birds into the ark. So they could be used as food. You don't want carnivorous animals. Um, you don't want to eat them for supper, okay? And you don't want to eat. Uh, you don't want to eat ravens. You don't want to eat buzzards. Um, you don't want to eat any animals that are not clean because that would not be good for you, and that will be codified in the law of Moses uh, centuries later. But that's one of the reasons that there were supposed to be seven instead of two of the clean animals is for food. But the second reason is for sacrifice. And and we will see after the if you if you look at it after the flood Noah offered sacrifices of the clean animals to God. So for sacrifice and food that's why. And then the second question from this person was why was Noah upset with his son Ham in Genesis chapter 9. So let's read that story. This was shortly after the flood. And it says in Genesis chapter 9, this is what she's referring to. 
Let's read verse 19, Genesis 9, beginning in 19, 18. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Interesting that, interesting that God mentions that, that Ham would be the father of Canaan. Might have something to do with the answer. Verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. 20, and Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, again, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. 23. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Speaking of Cain, or I should say uh, Ham, 25, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Okay, so again, the question, why was Noah upset with his son Ham? Well, because obviously Noah committed a terrible sin. He got drunk. He didn't have any clothes on. He's laying in his tent drunk and naked. His son Ham comes in. And he sees what's going on here. He, see, he sees his father in this ungodly condition. And what does Ham do? He goes out and he tells his two brothers, Shem and Japheth. Now the proper thing for Ham to do would have been to see that and to cover his father up. And probably not to mention it at all to his two brothers. The Bible says that some sins are so, so shameful that it is a shame even to speak of them. And if Ham would have been a decent, God-fearing man, he would not have made an issue out of this. He would not have left his father naked and drunk and run out to tell his two brothers, come in and see, is the implication, what our dad is is like right here. Tell, to come in and see, look at the condition of our father, drunk and naked, laying in his tent. It seems as if Ham couldn't tell his two brothers about the condition of their father. And again, the decent thing, what would you do? I mean, if you're a Christian man or woman, what would you have done? You would have covered your, your father up. And, and if you would have told somebody about it, if you would have told your siblings about it, it wouldn't have been to get them to come in and see. It would have been, hey, we got to pray for dad. Hey, he, got, he got into sin here. This is not good. See, that's what Ham did. And it's, and it's so clear, the contrast between how Ham handled this situation and his two brothers handled it. Because Ham went out and told them, left his father the way he was. So, I mean, that's indicative of a problem in Ham, right? But his two brothers, here's the exact opposite. They grab a blanket or something, and they walk in backwards so that they don't see the nakedness of their father, and they cover him up. There was respect there with Japheth and with Shem. And so Noah got upset with Ham, but then he specifically mentions, cursed be Canaan. And it's mentioned a couple of times here that Canaan is the son of Ham. Now, a little later on, and I don't remember the fella that I listened to, but this, I thought it really clicked with me. And I'd give him credit if I knew his name, but I don't. Sorry. Maybe some of you will recognize it. Um, but in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, we saw that the sons of God came into the daughters of men and produced Nephilim, an, an ungodly half-breed giant race, not, neither angels nor man. But Satan was attempting to produce an irredeemable human race, so to speak, so that the Messiah could not be born a pure man and then, and then redeem 
the sins of man because he had to be made like one of us in order to pay for our sins. Well, if Satan can corrupt the human race, which is what he tried to do in Genesis chapter 6 by having these fallen angels cohabitate with human women, um, then the Savior couldn't be born. Now, I, I, you can go back and listen to my message on Genesis 6 concerning that issue. But the Bible says that there were giants in the earth in those days and also afterwards, afterwards. So they weren't confined just to the period before Noah. But that is the reason that God wiped out the world, because the whole world had become corrupt by the time of Noah. Which And it doesn't mean spiritually. Well, they were spiritually corrupt, but phys physically corrupt. The whole population, with the exception of Noah, the Bible says, had become corrupt. Noah and his three sons and his wife were not corrupt. Physically, they were not tainted with, with the genes of these Nephilim or fallen angels, okay? But then, so that's why, God, that's why God wiped out the whole world in the flood because everybody said Noah and his immediate family was corrupted. He had to start all over, wiped out all the Nephilim, sent the angels into a deep, dark pit known as the abyss or Tartarus, the angels who had done that. And they're still locked up there today, according to the book of Jude and First Peter in the New Testament. Both talks about that. But then here's the interesting thing. Later on, when the Israelites are going into the promised land, do you remember when, when, when Joshua sent the 12 spies in or Moses sent the 12 spies in to check out the, the promised land? The 12 spies came back with a report. 10 of the 12, all of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, said, we can't go in there. We, God promised that he would defeat the Canaanites for us, but we can't go in there. We're going to lose. We're going to get killed because we're like grasshoppers. They're giants. The Nephilim are in the land. And they were. They were. The land was filled with giants. Specifically, there were four groups of people that were giants. Nephilim. And the question arises, how did they get in there? If they were all destroyed in the flood, how did that happen? Now, some people think that Satan pulled the fast one again, did the same thing, had some fallen angels cohabitate with human women again and started it all over again. This time they were limited to the promised land, which, by the way, is why God told the Israelites to go in there and wipe them all out. Men, women, children, period, every one of them. Genocide. Wipe them all out. And a lot of people have a problem with God telling the Israelites to go do that when they entered the promised land. To wipe out everybody. Just completely wipe them out. Yes. Genocide. Just like with the flood. God wiped out that whole entire race of half-breeds, the Nephilim. He wanted them to do it again in the promised land. It was limited to the promised land. It wasn't worldwide this time. But still, it was the same thing. And that's why God said, wipe them all out. They're not humans. They're not, they're not purebred. There's this half-breed. But the question is, how did that happen? Well, it, there can only be two things. Either Satan caused some more fallen angels to do the same old thing as he tried to do, or as he did do, before the flood. Or somewhere within the genes of Noah or his sons, or his sons' wives, there was a gene of these Nephilim. And some people, this one man that, that I'm sorry, I can't think of his name, terrible memory, but he thinks that, uh, that uh, by the way, let, let's just back up a little bit. Those tribes that are spoken of in the land of Canaan that are described as being Nephilim and giants, all of those tribes, all of those groups of people were descendants of Ham and descendants of Canaan. Descendants of Ham, descendants of Canaan. So, when, when Noah cursed Canaan, the son of Ham, there are those who think that old Canaan was showing signs of being a Nephilim, perhaps six fingers, because that's what his descendants had 
by the time Joshua and company got to the promised land. There were giants. They had six fingers. They had 12, 12 fingers, 12 toes. Giant, huge. And some people think that Canaan, Noah looked at Canaan and saw 12 fingers. It's starting again. There was the seed. So he cursed Canaan. But he was upset with Ham. Evidently Ham's wife, if that's true, was tainted. Ham wasn't. Japheth wasn't. Shem wasn't. Noah's wife wasn't. Noah wasn't. Had to come through the daughter. And that's how they began to reproduce in the promised land. But anyway, I hope I, hope I didn't babble too much. I hope you got it. That's why Noah was upset with Ham and with Canaan, both of them. Cursed Canaan, upset with Ham, upset with Ham because he handled how he handled the situation. Cursed Canaan because there was some Nephilim in this guy, and he knew what that would eventually lead to. So hopefully that helps. Now here's another question um, from a recent study. A listener wrote, you mentioned that when Rachel drew water for Eliezer and the camels to drink, that she had to make, she had to make a number of trips going up and down the stairs to get the water. And the questioner, the listener asked, what stairs? What stairs? That's a good question. Because, and then she quotes verse 16, which was great, which says, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher. And she's right. It doesn't say that there were stairs. She, so I love it. I love it when listeners are this meticulous and want to be this precise concerning the Word of God. Because if I say something that cannot be backed with truth, then I certainly want to know it so that I can repent of it, okay? So she asks a good question. What stairs? Verse 16 says, she went down to the well and filled her pitcher. And then she kind of answers her own question, though, because she says, or were the wells back in those days large enough for a person to walk into in order to draw water. And actually, that is the truth, and that's the answer to that question. And, and I did, I think I, I said that when I was teaching in Genesis 24, verses 16 through 19, that uh, wells, there were, when we think of a well, we think of, we think of a crank. We think of a hole in the ground, right, with a, with a little cylinder with a cover on it. We think of a crank with a bucket, but that's not the kind of wells that were around back in those days. The wells were around, that were around in those days, many of them were big enough that they did have stairs that you walked down to the water. It was like a little reservoir almost. And then you got your water, you filled your bucket or jar or whatever it was, and then you walked up the stairs. So, yeah, that's what she did. That's what Rebecca did. She, uh, she went down the stairs several hundred times because she... She watered the camels, the ten camels of Eliezer, the uh, servant of, of uh, Abraham. And remember, when he arrived at the well, he was looking for a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. And this was 500 miles away from home. And he uttered a prayer. He said, God, he said, you know, I'm looking for a wife for uh, my master's son Isaac. Show me the right one. When I ask for a drink of water, let her say, let her say, okay, I'll give you a drink of water, and I'll also give enough water for all your camels. And sure enough, he asked Rebecca for a drink of water, and Rebecca immediately said, yeah, I'll give you a drink of water, paraphrasing, and I'll also draw enough water to satisfy your camels. He had 10 camels, and a thirsty camel could drink, a, a thirsty camel could drink 40 gallons of water. So she brought up 400 gallons possibly of water, for those camels. And that was an answer to that guy's prayer. But to, uh, evidently she went down into the well, down the stairs, back and forth that many times. What a woman. And that's the answer to that question. Another question. Um, the writer says, I listen to you daily and thank Jesus for you. I've learned a lot. I appreciate that. He says, I've got a question. Are people biblically justified to call themselves apostles today? That is a good question. I don't have Facebook anymore, but when I used to, and I would get friend requests, 
Whenever I got a friend request from somebody who called themselves an apostle, I declined it because there's no such thing. The question was, are people biblically justified to call themselves apostles today? The short answer is no. But I'll give you the reason why, and it's a biblical answer. The answer to that question, are there apostles today, in the sense of apostles back in, in the New Testament, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, the answer is absolutely not. And we don't, we're not left to even guess about that one because Peter lays out the qualifications of an apostle back in the book of Acts. When they're trying to find somebody to replace Judas, who fell into sin and then killed themselves, he had to be replaced because there needed to be 12 apostles, so they needed to pick one. So they chose two candidates, both of whom had the proper qualifications, which Peter laid out. And here are the qualifications of an apostle, okay, right here. They needed to have been with Jesus for the entire three-plus years that Jesus was among them, ministering. So they had to be somebody who was with Jesus the whole while, three plus years. Um, they needed to be an eyewitness of the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ and how the Father spoke from heaven audibly and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They had to be a witness to that. They also had to, uh, they also had to be present with Jesus and, and, and heard him teach for those three years and to see his healings and all of his other miracles they needed to be an eyewitness of the crucifixion they also needed to have seen the risen lord and to have walked with him and talked with him and eaten with him and witnessed all these things after he was raised from the dead and also seen his ascension back into heaven and there isn't anyone who fits that category today. You can call yourself an apostle, and I think a lot of times it's just an opportunity or an attempt to, for people to draw attention to themselves, to put themselves on a pedestal. Whatever the motivation, I don't know and I don't care. All I know is there is no such thing as a biblical apostle alive in the world today. Then there's one more question. We've got time for one more here. Uh, the writer says, your messages are a real blessing. Appreciate that. Got a couple of questions. First one is, uh, what version of the Bible are you using? That's an easy one to answer. I use the King James Version right here. The King James Version, 1611, and sometimes I use the Third Millennial Bible, which is also a King James Version, 1611, just with a couple of word changes it's it's built on the same manuscript evidence. It's built on the same received text. It is the King James of, uh, Version 1611. The only thing it does is replace the archaic words or the words that have changed their meaning. And for that reason, I like that too. The Third Millennial Bible or the King James Version 1611. That's the Bible that I use. And uh, if you're interested in, in why, you can go to my website and click on Bible translations, and my uh, study, my message on Bible translations will come up. Let's see, um, is there anything else here? There is one more question, but I don't have to get time to, I don't have time to get to it, so we're going to stop for today, but thank you for, for sending in your questions, and again, I encourage you, if you have any questions for me or any comments, please feel free to send them in to uh, the Scripture Verse by Verse website which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go there and just, you can send a question right there with the form that is at thebibleversebyverse.com. Um, or you can email your questions to scriptureversebyverse, scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com. That's scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com. One more time. Send your questions or your comments to scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com or go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. There's a form there you can fill out and send your questions directly to me that way as well. One more time, 
The email is scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com or the website, thebibleversebyverse.com. Please pray for this ministry. And if you want to be a part of this ministry of getting out the Word of God, you can be with your prayers and financial support. And I also want to encourage you to please study the Word of God. If you haven't started yet, begin a verse-by-verse study of God's Word with me at our website, thebibleversebyverse.com. Because all you got to do is click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along in your Bible, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. One more time, that's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the, if the Lord leads you to help support this ministry, that would be wonderful. Keep in mind that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. 30 plus years I've depended on people like you who love the Word of God to keep this ministry going. And you can give in a secure method, as the Lord may lead, at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the Donate button at the top of the front page. One more time, thebibleversebyverse.com. Thanks for spending this time with me. Remember, send me your questions. Until then, so long, everyone.